Ma'am, you can start. Okay, I think we'll begin. So, um, we are back with the second session of the IN YNF for this season. And uh, this time we had decided to do things uh, slightly differently by trying to uh, sort of pick up a theme and uh, take up cases and uh, presentations and discussions around that theme. So, our first session, we had two very interesting cases of epilepsy, which were very well discussed and attended. And this time we are back with a movement disorders theme. And for that, we have an excellent uh, panel of uh, speakers, presenters, and moderators. And the uh, coordinator for this session is Dr. Vaisak, who has done a lot of work in organizing this. So without further ado, I will hand over the session to Dr. Vaisak to please introduce the presenters, speakers, and to conduct the session. Yeah, good morning to all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dibyani and Dr. Ajay sir, for giving me this opportunity. So uh, movement disorder is one subspecialty of neurology, which includes the clinician, the electrophysiologist, as well as uh, the uh, radiologist. So without further delay, we will go into both the spectrum of movement disorders, the hyperkinetic as well as the hypokinetic spectrum. From the hyperkinetic spectrum, we have a wonderful case uh, from uh, Dr. Jackie Gangli Center, Institute of Neurosciences, Calcutta. And uh, our, the presenter is Dr. Neha Pandit. She is a clinical fellow at movement disorders at Institute of Neuroscience, Calcutta. And we will uh, right away start the discussion because we want to finish the session before the talk time. So yeah, we are ready to go. Over to you, Dr. Janky. Janky. Uh, our uh, senior moderator for the session today is uh, our guide and mentor, Dr. Sham Krishnan. He has also joined. Welcome, sir. He is a professor of neurology and head of uh, Movement Disorder Center at the Chitra Thirinal Institute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vaishak, Dibyani, Ajay. Welcome, sir. For, for the opportunity. Let's start now. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. My case is Secrets of a Shaky Young. So this was a 17-year-old female born out of non-consanguineous marriage who presented to us with generalized tremulousness since last two years, gait imbalance since last one year, and slurring of speech since last three months. And there was no significant family history. So coming to the video examination of the patient. Ma'am, the video has no audio, no? Oh, actually, I have... Uh, do one thing. Click on the new share. One minute. Yeah. Click on the new share. Icon. Yeah, I did it. Yeah. And bottom, there are two options. Share sound and optimize screen. Click on the share sound. And then hit the share button. Reshare button. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, fine. Is it audible now? Brief code to line a volo. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I will restart it again. Tickets. Bolo ta 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 ta. That's a bolo kaka kaka. Panadio, normal rako. That's a thin take a jury volo pa ta ka pa ta ka. So this was the speech of the patient. It was ataxic and extraocular movements were full. There was no nystagmus.
So there was action poster tremor on both sides, more on the right side. And also in wing beating position, it was more on the right side. Coarse tremor. And the gait was grossly ataxic. And there was generalized tremulousness seen in the trunk, seen in head, and bilateral lower limbs as well. Tendum could not be performed as the patient was grossly ataxic. There was bilateral dysmetria. Finger nose finger is grossly impaired as we can see in this video. Heel sheen test was impaired as well bilaterally and all deep tendon reflexes were brisk yeah so uh, the points that have not been uh, discussed in the video are that the high mental function examination, cranial nerve examination and sensory examination was normal. So to summarize, this is a 17-year-old female born out of non-consanguineous marriage without any previous comorbidities who presented to us with complaints of gradual onset, slowly progressive spastic cerebellar ataxia and dysarthria since last two years without any history suggestive of involvement of higher mental function, sensory involvement, with normal birth and developmental history without any significant family history. So after this history and examination, we thought mainly of all the conditions that can cause gradual onset, slowly progressive ataxia. And first in our mind was the genetic heridodegenerative ataxias. So we thought of spinocerebellar ataxia, but the negative point was there was no family history. Then complicated, complicated HSP like SPG7 and 11 but the eye uh, extraocular movements were full. There was no visual loss, no autonomic symptoms were there. Then autosomal recessive ataxia like Frederick's, RSEC, SIGN1, and AVED. But in Frederick's, there is hyporeflexia, whereas in our case, the pyramidal signs were present. Also, there were no skeletal abnormalities and uh, there was uh, the square wave jerks were normal. Then uh, R6, uh, in R6, we usually see neuropathy, amyotrophy, cognition abnormalities, which was not in our case. Then sign one, again in sign one, there are cognition abnormalities can be there, eye movement can be abnormal. Then AVED, uh, again, uh, AVED has uh, hyporeflexia and vision abnormalities can be there, which was not in our case. Wilson was also kept in the differential because it is treatable, but there was no KF ring, no psychiatric features and no extra pyramidal features were there. Then adult onset leukodystrophy like Alexander Krabby's, but the cognition was normal. There were no psychiatric issues, no bowel bladder involvement, bulbar involvement, no palatal myoclonus as is seen in the Alexander. Uh, then vitamin B12 and copper deficiency, uh, but there was no history of GI surgery, malabsorption. Then celiac disease, there was no history of diarrhea, malabsorption. And demyelination, paraneoplastic are less likely because it is a very long history. And for paraneoplastic, there was no history suggestive of any malignancy. So we thought to evaluate on the lines of all these differentials. So routine investigations were done, which were normal. Vitamin B12, vitamin E, thyroid profile, glucose, serum copper, and serum celluloplasmin was normal. EEG was normal. CSF was normal, including oligoclonal bands. CCT chest abdomen was normal. And in eye findings, uh, everything uh, was normal. There was no evidence suggestive of cherry red spot, retinopathy, cataract, optic atrophy, or KF ring. MRI brain showed something. Uh, it yes, showed sir. hyperintensity in uh, the... Yes, sir? Yeah, just uh, there was a discussion going on if we can uh, discuss a bit of the phenomenology for the residents. So okay, before okay, going sir. to the MRI, if we okay. just uh, discuss the phenomenology a bit. Okay, okay, okay. Ta, 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 ta. अच्छा बोलो काका काका 
পানারিও না নরমাল রাখো হ্যাঁ আচ্ছা এবার তিনটাকে জুড়ে বলো পা টাকা পা টাকা ঠিক এখন কি অসুবিধা হচ্ছে একটু ব্রিফ করে দু লাইনে বলো ट्रंक we can also see head tremor and tremor is in the lower limbs as well so so far now we are getting a kind of cerebellar syndrome with little bit of asymmetry both axial yes, and appendicular uh, involvement is there yes sir with pyramidal signs yeah hmm. so dysmetria is there Heel shin test, which is abnormal. And knee jerk is brisk. Also, a little bit of clonus can also be seen on the right yeah. side. So this was the examination. yeah now we can discuss mm -hmm. the mri yes sir so uh, mri of the patient showed hyper intense lesion in the brain stem as we can see here so the hyper intense lesions were present in pons as well as mid brain then there was uh, hypothalamus uh, the thalamus later part of the thalamus sli showed slight hyper intensity but the posterior part of the internal capsule posterior lip of internal capsule it was hyper intense and there was hypo intensity in the globus pallidus and we can see that there is periventricular hyper intensity is present on both sides symmetrically uh, here we can see there is cerebellar atrophy there is cerebral atrophy and again the brain stem lesions then uh, in this image we can again see the brain stem changes brain stem hyper intense signal and there is slight hypo intensity in bilateral dentate nucleus as well so uh, we did the comprehensive scar panel it was negative uh, the whole exome sequencing was done it was again negative as well did not show any pathogenic mutation so after going through all the investigations and evaluating all the causes that we had considered uh we were not anywhere we did not come to any conclusion so let's so, pause in here and yeah, uh, yes sir see uh, the discussion if somebody yes, wants yes, to sir. comment for yes, the basic yes. session hmm. so dr bisha re residents can post in this right yeah the, yeah so uh, yeah, there are a couple of questions for you all so someone has asked whether there was a hint of cervical dystonia in the patient and uh, if if so or if not so why do you say that and whether how can you differentiate a dystonic tremor from a cerebellar tremor in such a situation uh, okay. there was yeah. go ahead uh, there was no dystonic tremor in this patient and there basically it is titubation and in dystonic tremor mainly there is null point 
and the dystonic tremor resolves while lying down supine position so this was not in this case so may, it might look like dystonia because she is sitting like this but there was no dystonia i will play the video again yeah actually what happens when there is severe axial involvement of the ataxia it will look like that mm. there was no dystonia ataxia mm. everywhere very marked ataxia and along with the pyramidal signs mm. and stress reflexes actually all were brisk mm. just mm. 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 shall i go ahead yeah dibani any other question yeah there's someone else who's asked that uh, after the mri why did you go ahead with the scar panel actually we had ordered it previously only and uh, we know that these findings are not found in scar but we just wanted to rule out so that's sure. why we did it yeah then that's uh, uh, that's about it a couple of people have hmm. asked whether it's nbi or wilson so we have some answers to, coming yeah uh, it's uh, nbi wilson we have kept in the dds but yes. after going through all the genetic tests it was negative and nbi usually does not so, show this type of hyper intensity in the brain stem we see the iron deposition which was not seen in this uh, mri and gre was also normal like no iron mm, yeah. deposition in gre as yeah, well yeah 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 so for scar panel actually common things first and we went for that any young mm. patient with uh, gross ataxia with some tremor yeah we went for that scar panel but definitely after getting the mri and evaluating significant brain stem involvement we thought of something else and even whole exome sequencing come negative so any guess yeah. from the residents if what should how should we proceed or what should be the approach in these type of cases and then we'll give the diagnosis right now dr wants to Yeah, we would love to have some comments from Professor Sham, please. Sham sir. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was thinking uh, it is basically for uh, the benefit of the residents who are attending this. Uh, this uh, uh, phenomenologically, it fits best with a uh, home stomach. <laughs> so the patient has a very coarse uh, postural kinetic as well as. Uh, like uh, I'm a postural and kinetic tremor with a relatively low frequency, and it is predominantly proximal. The only, only, only negative uh, regarding homes is like uh, this patient doesn't have a rest tremor. Apparently, in the video, there is no rest tremor. But otherwise, it fits in with a home tremor. Home mm -hmm. tremor is uh, the terminology which is uh, currently used in place of uh, what we used to call midbrain tremor or rural tremor. It can occur not only because of lesions in the midbrain, but uh, thalamic lesions or brainstem lesions also. That is why the terminology rural tremor or uh, midbrain tremor is you know, no longer used, and it is preferred term is home tremor. So uh, this is grossly asymmetrical. Uh, it's a home tremor, which indicates that the cerebellar outflow tracts are involved. So generally, home tremor occurs when there is a significant degree of structural damage. So uh, what I feel is like it is very unusual to have for somebody to present somebody with a spinocerebellar attacks to present as a asymmetric <laughs> onset home tremor. And when there is a presentation, we have to think of uh, some acquired cause uh, like inflammatory or uh, demyelinating or similar causes. And uh, again, Wilson's disease is another condition which can present as So this is just for the sake of benefit of the residents who are attending this. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Shall I proceed? Are there any other questions? Yeah, yeah. you can. Uh, you can go ahead, and we can take them towards uh, the later part. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Okay, thank you. so uh, when all the tests was uh, were done and they were negative including the genetic testing so we thought to reevaluate the history again and we asked the patient whether there is any history of abuse so yes she was basically sniffing the glue since last 2 to 3 years and these were all the substances that we found at her home so uh, this was a case of glue sniffing ataxia this was another case who presented to us few years back i would just like to share the video of this case as well
So as we can see, broad-based gate, a taxic gate, and bilateral postural tremor is there, also in wing beating position. Again, it is asymmetrical in this case as well. Then bilateral dysmetria was there. And this was the MRI of uh, the second patient. It also showed the similar findings that the little part of thalamus, it is hypointense with hyperintensity in the posterior limb of internal capsule. Again, with hypointensity in the globus pallidus and hypointensity in bilateral dentate nucleus. So coming to glue sniffing ataxia, the first case was reported in 1961 by Daniel E. Grabsky. And the youngest case that has been reported was a four-year-old boy. So basically what happens that inhalant abuse is very common among the adolescents as it is easily available, it is cheap and also there are no legal issues associated with this. And also uh, majority of the daily substances that are present in our home, uh, they contain these uh, inhalants like correction fluids, dry clinic fluids, glues, nail polish remover, paint thinners, petrol, deodorants, hair sprays, fabric protector sprays, spray paints, vegetable oil sprays, cigarette lighter fluid, medical anesthetics, and whipped cream. So what are the methods of the inhalant abuse? It is mainly consumed in, in three ways by the abusers. First is the sniffing, that is nasal inhalation, as is seen in this picture. It is the sniffing of the vapors directly from an open container or surface soaked with the substance. Then huffing or oral inhalation from a rag or cloth that has been soaked in the volatile substance. Then bagging is breathing in and out of the plastic bag filled with a small amount of the volatile substance. And the concentration of the substance that is inhaled from bagging is the maximum, followed by huffing and sniffing. Uh, also, bagging is the most toxic one since the effect may be intensified by hypoxia and hypercapnia as a result of exhaled air being reabsorbed. So, what is the mechanism? Basically, uh, after the toluene is inhaled, uh, after inhalation of the toluene, it is rapidly absorbed in the lungs over a period of one to three minutes. So, initial effects are acceleration, the high that the patient gets, and at the concentration more than 3000 ppm, uh, the patient will have CNS depression and ataxia, dysarthria, all those things will be there. And it is metabolized in the liver where it is converted to hepuric acid and ultimately it is excreted through the kidneys. But on repeated exposure over years, it gets accumulated in the various organs like CNS and other lipid rich organs like kidneys, adrenal glands and ovaries. So the mechanism of CNS toxicity is initial excitatory response because of the epinephrine release and activation of the dopaminergic system in the ventral tegmental area and nucleus accumbens, followed by CNS depression because of the GABA release. So at dose exceeding 200 ppm, there is fatigue, headache, paresthesias, and slowed reflexes. Then at dose 600 or more than 600 ppm, there is confusion. At dose more than 800 ppm, there is euphoria, excitation, disinhibition, acceleration, and ataxia. This is the most important dose because in order to get the high, the in individuals uh, with inhalant abuse, they deliberately expose themselves to this level. And then uh, when it is repeated over a period of time, at doses more than 3000 ppm, the CNS depression will start. Uh, followed by dysarthria, disorientation, weakness, and sedation. And at more than 10,000 ppm, the patient will have cardiorespiratory failure, coma, or death. So uh, after chronic exposure, over a period of two years or more, patient will have dementia, nystagmus, seizures, cranial nerve damage, cerebellar damage, and peripheral neuropathy can also be there. And other systems can also get involved like renal, hepatic, respiratory, cardiovascular muscles, gastrointestinal, and hemato hematological and it is teratogenic as well. So uh, coming to the uh, MRI findings. So white matter hyperintensity is the most common finding that is seen in approximately 50% of the patients. And it can be seen in uh, periventricular areas, centrum semi ovale cerebellar hemispheres, internal capsule and brainstem. Then thalamic hypointensity seen in 20% of the patient. And also hypointensity can be seen in red nucleus, globus pallidus, substantia nigra and dentate nucleus. And atrophy can be seen in cerebral and cerebellar and thinning of corpus callosum can be seen as well.
So as we can see in this picture, there is ventricular dilatation because of the gross cerebellar at cerebral atrophy. And in this, we can see that there is a thinning of the corpus callosum. Here, we can again see there is ventricular dilatation in both these pictures and uh, there is periventricular hyperintensities along with the atrophy. Also, in this uh, uh, picture, we can see the similar findings. And this was the sign that was, I was mentioning. That is, there is hypointensity of the thalamus, hyperintensity of the internal capsule posterior limb, and hypointensity again of the globus pallidus, again seen in this image as well. And one important thing is that, that we usually say that the face of the giant panda sign is associated with the Wilson disease, but it, it can also be seen in the toluene abuse, as is seen in this image. So it is not specific for the Wilson disease. And now coming back again to the uh, MRI images of our patient. So uh, as discussed, patient can have brainstem hyperintensities, though the face of the giant panda was not seen in our case. Then the typical finding of the uh, hypointensity in the thalamus and hyperintensity in posterior limb of internal capsule and hyperintensity again in the globus pallidus was there and hypointensity in the dentate nucleus. There is cerebellar atrophy, brainstem changes, and there was dentate nucleus hypointensity, brainstem changes again. And this was the second case in which, again, there was the similar finding. And dentate nucleus hypointensity was present as well. So uh, the laboratory testing is there, but it is not uh, very beneficial. There are a lot of limitations. It is not widely available, and it requires special switching, uh, shipping uh, arrangements because of the highly volatile nature of these substances. Also, hyperuric acid can be found in the healthy subjects as well because it is a metabolite of the normal diet. So therefore, the false positive findings can be there. So there is no specific treatment, only supportive uh, care to be given. So the take-home message is the glue sniffing ataxia should especially be considered in young individuals who present with coarse tremor and ataxia without any definite suggestive etiology. Uh, it can cause permanent damage. It is not always reversible. There is no specific treatment. Therefore, education and timely intervention will prevent the further damage. So uh, say no to dendrite sniffing will be our message. Also, Glue to your uh, glue your eyes to the match in the evening. Hopefully, we will win. And but also don't forget about this glue, which is important for neurologists. <laughs> Thank you. So really nice uh, case, uh, Dr. Neha and Dr. Jackie, thank you, and uh, thank you for uh, presenting this very rare condition, I think. I really wonder, I mean, how did you actually, like, was it the MRI that guided the subsequent history of glue sniffing or they were forthcoming actually, with that history up front? Actually, what happened, to be honest, I also missed it. When I first saw the patient, I missed it and I never thought of glue sniffing initially by seeing that patient. But one point now, if we go back to the history, her symptom started with tremor. Tremor was the first symptom for two years and then gait imbalance started in one and a half year, one year. So no significant family history, this kind of young presentation where everything, we were definitely in doubt that SCA is a very rare possibility. But, you know, here she was not in Agarwal, but so much SCA-12 common and we see a lot of patients in almost all age group we are now seeing, even some younger age group. But definitely this is too young for SCAR-12. So everything was negative and MRI that when we saw that picture in the MRI, even that time, first diagnosis definitely was not glue ataxia, but we reverted. We went through, we discussed the MRI again, we read about it and that finding was there. So classic finding for the residents to remember that internal capsule, posterior limb of internal capsule, hyper intensity and hypo intensity on two sides. It's kind of a river. So hyper intensity in the posterior limb and the two banks of the river are hypo intense, lateral thalamus and medial globus pallidus. So that's the clue. So we asked for that, that whether do you have this kind of exposure and they definitely see revealed and everything came out from the bag. That's how it went. So I think very intriguing case and uh, I think uh, that uh, I would love to have comments from uh, Dr. Sham what he thinks about this and uh, whether you have yourself seen any such uh, cases and if you can add something. Yeah, this is a very, uh, I congratulate uh, the panel as well as Dr. Jackie, Jackie for presenting this case because this is a very, very rare case I think it needs to be reported. 
uh, in some good channel. Uh, so uh, we have seen, uh, long ago, we have seen one patient with uh, probable brainstem vasculitis related to substance abuse uh, years ago, uh, which was empirically treated with steroids and all, and he gradually improved. Uh, it was not glue stiffing, it was some other substance of abuse. Uh, he also had some brainstem changes. He also presented with tremor, but not a uh, gross tremor like this. Uh, so this is a uh, very, uh, very, I think it's a very rare situation, but this new stiffing is uh, fairly common among uh, teenagers. That is what I believe. So yeah. this I, sh I think should go to the society also uh, that uh, mm -hmm. this can cause very nasty problems like this. And then and there is no specific uh, treatment also. No? It is only symptomatic mm -hmm. treatment. There is no specific treatment to be offered. And sometimes this damage can be permanent. So I think this message should go to the society. It's a very good case. And sir, I will need to add that when we saw this thing and we found it, we asked that where you used to sniff glue because mother initially did not know. But in the school bag, every time she used to say like mother knew, okay, my daughter loves painting and she used to carry those kind of things for the painting thing. And in the school, they have a group of three, four girls who are doing this. So now... We are like we would like to try to bring those girls and see whether tremor is there or not in those, because as I mentioned, community tracking is very important, and many people, those parents are not known about this. Many clinicians, we need more awareness. So I mean, another uh, which is going yeah. along that a couple of questions are there from the audience. Okay, someone has suggested why can't it be called a river sign? But yes, yeah, so taking on from what you just said. And uh, uh, another question was about the dose uh, relation, as in how long was this exposure for this uh, girl um, before yeah, she manifested? As a... She said it at least like more than two years and kind of after using it one year. So around three years at least. Okay. okay. Somebody had asked what could be the difference diagnosis other than Vincent. So what are the, is there any leukodystrophy which can present like this or can be mitochondrial? Yes. Yes, leukodystrophies can present. I, I think somebody pointed out uh, Bechet's disease in the comment box. Mm, yeah. disease, that yes. is uh, like Bechet's, uh, when there is, you have brainstem involvement like this with pyramidal signs, cerebral, you, you should consider exactly. Bechet's also. Yeah, yeah. we considered so somebody, that because uh, kind of brainstem, we thought in that way, whether what are the inflammatory conditions that can affect the brainstem. So everything will come, even RDM chest man disease, Langerhans and histiocytosis. Uh, sarcoidosis, bechet, everything was there. So we had evaluated from that side. CT chest abdomen was done, so it's normal, no oral ulcer, no genital ulcer. And yeah, everything came negative. CSF was done, CSF absolutely normal. And C heart cell revealed the diagnosis. And then the clinical point of MS and anti and all those conditions. But MRI is against MRI is not like that of an MS. But... Yeah, exactly. Sir, NMO can present like this, diffuse brainstem in modern, but then the duration is odd for NMO. Yeah, duration is Sir, uh, predominantly trauma presentation uh, like this. I'm not sure. And lesions are extensive. No? NMO is very busy. Lesions are busy. But here, like, extensive lesions now. That is unusual with yes. NMO. And we did, so uh, anti-mog, anti we all did, considering the demyelination also, even oligoconan band, and everything came negative. Sir, uh, how do we differentiate uh, uh, spasticity or just with breast major or do we need something else to say that there is a definite pyramidal involvement in such cases? Somebody has asked a question in that. What's the question? To, def to definitely say that there is an additional pyramidal involvement in a patient with that type of breast reflexes uh, itself is enough or do we need to have some other findings? Uh, reflexes like, can be a little uh, in cerebellar involvement also. But if there is convincing spasticity, then I think that is sufficient. And definite pyramidal, to say definite pyramidal, I think we should either have extensive plantar or sustained clonus. So neither are extensive, plantar was extensive in this patient? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Planters were extensive and tone was increased. There was yeah. spasticity. That is a very it clear is evidence nice. of pyramidal involvement. Hmm. So somebody has asked, is a follow-up of the patient available? So I think we, have yeah. patient we just saw one month ago. And definitely would like to follow up, not only her, but also would like to see her friends in the school, whether the similar symptoms they are having or not. Did you give any steroids or anything for this patient, just empirically? We have not given yet, sir. In the last patient that we saw two years ago, that Neha showed uh, the second case, 
that was seen by Dr. Rishi sir, and that patient actually stopped exposure. And last I saw him, I was asking him. Uh, symptoms there are some residual effect, but much better. The gait imbalance is better. Uh, so did you do a repeat imaging? Imaging? Sorry. Did you do a repeat imaging in that patient? Like, yeah, we we have done it. It's not yet available. We'll get it soon. We ordered it. Thank you. Is there any other question from the residents? Are there any blood tests to confirm the diagnosis, Doctor Daki? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, are there any blood tests to confirm the diagnosis? Somebody no, asked. as Neha mentioned, because the main culprit here is hippuric acid, and that's very non-specific. So we can't do any blood test. Yeah, thank you. So, if there are no questions, uh, we will just uh, conclude the case. It was an excellent case uh, by Dr. Neha and Dr. Jackie from Calcutta. Uh, the learning points which we identified were uh, asymmetric presence of uh, home stomach with the predominant proximal involvement along with ataxia. We have to think about a treatable cause or a structural cause and uh, with an imaging uh, which suggests a predominant brainstem involvement, a midbrain involvement, we should think of Wilson's uh, Bechet's disease and then uh, the obviously our uh, toluene poisoning also. So with this, uh, thank you for the excellent case. Shall we move to the second one? Dr. Viviani? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, so the second case uh, is uh, from uh, by Dr. Vaibo from uh, uh, Dr. Vaibo Madhur. He is a consultant neurologist and movement disorder specialist from Narayana Hospital, Jaipur. And the uh, presenter will be Ashtosh Dudara. He's a DNB final year uh, senior resident from Jesslock Hospital, Mumbai. And this is a case from the hypokinetic spectrum. Over to you, Dr. Vaibhav and Dr. Ashtosh. Morning, everyone. So uh, our case, uh, we have titled it as slow and uh, steady might lose the race. So uh, he was a 40, uh, 50, uh, she was a 58-year-old right handed lady, uh, married, educated till BA from Mumbai. The informant, uh, her son, daughter-in-law, and some inputs from the patient. So she had uh, uh, chief complaints of difficulty in speaking since last uh, one, one and a half month, clumsiness in right upper lip and lower lip since uh, one and a half month, visual difficulties since one month, difficulty in swallowing since uh, 15 days of uh, presentation, and excessive somnolence since last 15 days. So Mrs. E.G. had visited us with her son and daughter-in-law after uh, 1.5, uh, one and a half months of illness onset. She had gone on 18 January to a mall and was playing bowling with her friend, family. She had sudden onset slurred speech and she told her daughter-in-law that she's fumbling with words. The speech difficulty was present in an intermittent fashion but uh, was again noticed uh, three days later while she was in a social gathering and one of the guests pointed out that she's misspelling the words. Six days later, uh, uh, six days later, he noticed that uh, clumsiness in her right hand uh, as she uh, spilled water from a glass and cups dropped from the right hand twice later that day. She was taken for evaluation to a nearby hospital and was started on aspirin 75. However, her speaking difficulty and right hand clumsiness were gradually progressive. Her speech worsened uh, in the form uh, that initially there were only misspells and slurring. Later, she was framing shorter sentences using only a few words. However, even with few words, she was able to convey her message and communicate. Later, her word output decreased so that she hardly spoke more than 5 to 10 words a day. However, she could clearly understand everything that her family members or doctors conversed uh, with her and tried to convey her thoughts with half-spoken words or mostly with gestures with her left hand. Right hand clumsiness, which was initially mainly a ring and little finger, involved palm within 1 to 2 weeks and later her whole hand was affected. She had increasing uh, difficulty to use right hand, causing uh, difficulty in tasks like breaking chapatis, holding objects, or performing any purposeful activities with her right hand, and started using her left hand for the same. In view of her gradual neurological deterioration, she went for another consultation on day 20 of onset of symptoms. Uh, there she underwent MRI and LP, and, uh, which was normal, and IV steroids were given for three days without any benefit, and she was discharged uh, uh, in 10 days. After a few days, she developed paucity of movements in right lower limb also. It was progressive and she could take steps while walking but needs uh, to effortfully lift her right body and drag her right foot. She also had difficulty in insinuating her right foot in footwear. 
However, she could independently stand and walk when she had uh, visited us. Later, uh, she also developed vision-related issues. Uh, the family members noticed that she turned her head to visualize people in front of her and sometimes uh, read newspaper and watches TV with a sideways gaze and turn her neck. She also used to bump uh, into objects while walking. There was, no, however, no pain on eye movements, double vision or blood vision. <clears throat> Moreover, she also developed difficulty in swallowing with, uh, with choking episodes for both solids and liquids and coughed frequently after ingestion. However, there, were, uh, there was no uh, result, uh, nasal regurgitation or nasal twang. There were occasional episodes of emotional lability. <clears throat> she also had excessive somnolence uh, during this period. She, uh, she, she slept at 9 p.m. and woke up at 9.30. And even in daytime, she used to sleep off during short periods of uh, idleness. However, there were, there were uh, no history of increasing uh, snoring, nocturnal awakenings, or, or deep and active behavior. According to the relatives, she had slowed down in her activities and took more time in doing uh, routine tasks. Her walking was slow and used to walk with short steps. However, there were no faults. <clears throat> Functional status uh, when she had visited us, the patient was ambulatory without any uh, without support. However, she uh, needed assistance for most uh, daily activities like eating, bathing, and dressing. She kept uh, she keeps her uh, right upper limbs in a flex posture at most times and uh, with a loosely closed fist. She 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 avoids uh, using uh, her right hand. She can, however, uh, actively open her right hand to some extent on command and passive movements are possible. Her physiotherapist says that even uh, while she is not using the right hand, she has relatively good strength on that side. She, would, she could crawl up her uh, bed and she could move her lower limbs on bed, but she finds difficulty walking and treks right foot. And she is continent for uh, urine and stool. So uh, coming to negative history, there was no history of any associated headache, fever, uh, hiccups, vomiting, seizures, weight loss. No history of any involuntary uh, motor activity or estrangement of limb. No, uh, She has no memory issues, no navigational deficits or major changes in her uh, behavior. There's no history of any altered sensorium, abnormal uh, facial brachial moments, uh, visual hallucinations, and myoclonic jogs. There's no history of any uh, uh, fall, sensory symptoms, thinning or twitching of any part of the body, or any urinary complaint. Uh, coming to past, she is hypertensive for the last four uh, years on treatment. Uh, pers personality, she, is, uh, mix, she has mixed diet. Uh, her appetite is normal. There is no addictions. She has constipation and passes stool once in every three to four days. And uh, in family history, she told that her mother passed in 1996 at the age of around 55, and she had paralysis, but it's not clear to them, and uh, she had got bad written. <coughs> so, uh, summarize, uh, we have our... Can we, can we go to the video once, Ashutosh? Yes, sir. We can go to the video now. Yeah. Amma. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, bolo. Sunday. Very good. So we can see that her speech was very effortful and uh, the word output was minimal. Uh, it was uh, a grammatic, hardly she could speak uh, uh, single words. And spontaneous speech it was almost uh, okay. five I am showing the only thing that is the only thing that is number. No, but you say number from the mouth. उसका नंबर कितना है मुंह से बोलो मुंह से बोलो हाँ कितना उंगली आई है नंबर बोलो हिंदी में कितना है क्या है 
चार ना अभी मुट्ठी खोलो बंद करो खोलो बंद करो अभी दूसरा हाथ से करो राइट हैंड से ओके अभी सामने देखो सामने देखो हाँ सामने देखते रहिए मैंने स्पोर्ट्स पॉजिटिव ऑन द राइट साइड सो ये राइट फील्ड इफेक्ट इक्वल फील्ड इफेक्ट अभी चल सकेंगे अच्छा ये हाथ मुट्ठी खोल के बंद कर सकते राइट हैंड राइट 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 अभी ये बॉल कैसा फेंकेंगे कॉम्प्रीहेंशन वॉज मोर लेस इंटेक्ट अच्छा चलो आगे चलो There are no jerks of a body. Huh? No, never. Never. Oh. That's it. Okay. Uh, so I think we can discuss the history. There is a lot of history to discuss. Should I uh, go back to this? Yeah. Uh, to so summarize, uh, we have a 58-year-old right-handed lady presenting with acute onset. A relatively rapid progressive uh, asymmetric right significantly more than left neurological illness characterized by language deficit clumsiness right more than left visual field defect bradykinesia dysphagia and hypersomnolence can we can we hold the localization so dr vesa can you residents that would like to discuss the history and the localization You can you can can continue discussion in that way. Yeah. Yeah. So. So, uh, uh, as as the patient the patient's word output was minimal. Uh, there was uh, telegraphic speech as well as uh, the comprehension was relatively intact. We uh, thought that uh, it would be an expressive aphasia. Uh, Uh, located in the posterior part of the, uh, so we would localize it to posterior part of left inferior frontal gyrus and the surrounding frontal fields and its connections uh, the uh, apre- uh, the uh, left sided i mean uh, right hand apraxia uh, we would uh, like like to uh, localize to left inferior parietal lobule and the uh, connection but however on the examination we would uh, we can uh, say by certain that the type of the apraxia and uh, visual field defect it mostly from the history as the patient uh, looked uh, Away, uh, I mean, uh, looked sideways for uh, visualizing. Uh, we thought that, and also there was history of uh, multiple uh, uh, bumping into objects. Uh, we thought that it would be hemianopia, and would uh, would like to localize into a uh, retrochiasmal uh, area. And bradykinesia, uh, definitely uh, basal ganglia and the connections. Dysphagia looked more like pseudo bulbar because the there was no nasal twang and uh, there was no history of any nasal uh, regurgitation. and hypersom uh, hypersomnolence uh, may be localized to thalamus hypothalamus connections or uh, brain stem so coming to differential uh, diagnosis based on history sorry 
uh, should we discuss it or should I uh, show the examination findings? What was not shown in the examination, we can first discuss that. Okay, got it. Okay. So, a uh, patient was uh, uh, conscious or uh, cooperative and well oriented. Uh, our uh, supine and sending BP was equal, there was no postural drop. General physical examination was normal, however, there was hypomimia and uh, the blink rate was reduced. Our higher mental function was very difficult to do uh, and complete MMSC in Feb were uh, not done in, in view of the significant uh, language deficits. However, we had attempted and I'll show uh, wh whatever we had done. She required repetition of commands and poor initiative to answer and comprehension was otherwise present. <clears throat> so in MF, sorry, uh, so uh, due to uh, significant uh, speech uh, involvement, uh, uh, we couldn't do most of the domains. Uh, the language, uh, the naming was uh, zero by two. Repetition was also affected. However, three stage command she could do uh, two steps. In, also, she could follow the written command. And writing and copying was uh, zero. Uh, Fab also similarly due to significant language deficits, we couldn't uh, perform it optimally. So uh, in mortal urea, she could do with with me uh, in conflict. So we had given one point conflict instruction also. And go no go one and prehension behavior, she didn't uh, hold that. So uh, we had given uh, three points. Uh, frontal lobe testing also, her insight was more or less intact. She knew that she had the disease. Judgment was also intact. She uh, When I asked that, uh, how, what will you do if there's fires, so she answered by gesture that she would run. And uh, attention, digit span was not possible, but tap a test I tried, but uh, there were many omissions. Categorical and lexical fluency was significantly impaired. Uh, trial A, with, she tried with the left hand, but it was impaired both A and B. Uh, graphic luria was impaired and all the primitive reflexes were absent. Uh, anti saccade was normal and uh, applause sign, uh, rather she couldn't do it because the, her, uh, she's almost, the right hand is almost useless. And tempo log testing also, uh, again, the immediate memory we couldn't test. Episodic also, uh, due to significant uh, impairment, we couldn't test. Uh, remote memory, she did try to uh, indicate her birth date and birthplace, but we were not sure whether it was correct. And even a semantic memory, she attempted to name uh, Prime Minister. Visual memory was more or less normal. She could point uh, to the objects. Uh, speech coming to language, uh, spontaneous speech, it was significantly no, uh, non fluent It was less than 10 words per minute. It was severely dysarthric, effortful, and halting. Categorically and lexical fluency, as I discussed earlier, was impaired. Comprehension was in, in, uh, uh, for simple commands was more or less in, uh, intact, but for complex, it was uh, uh, affected. Repetition uh, was present for simple words, but uh, dysarthric and complex uh, sentences she, could, she couldn't uh, repeat. Naming was impaired, uh, reading allowed with comprehension was non-fluent and had significant difficulty. Writing and copying was uh, significantly impaired. Vital, uh, uh, so, uh, we asked her to pantomime, uh, combing, bowling, as well as kicking a ball, but it was significant more on right. On left, it was there, but it was mild. She could, she could uh, after a few efforts, she could do. And imitation of gestures was also impaired. Uh, uh, we had asked to wave, gesture knowledge was impaired, sequential action, uh, was impaired. Conceptual knowledge was intact on showing the image. image. Yeah. So tool select, tool selection was normal. And real object use, we had given comp. She could, she couldn't do with right. She, with left, she could. Uh, the it uh, definitely improved. And limb kinetic component, we she couldn't uh, oppose the thumb and finger on the right side. But on left, she could do. So uh, we thought it. Uh, it was probably idiomotor apraxia as the conceptual knowledge was more or less, uh, more or less intact. <clears throat> Cortical sensation, sen uh, sensory testing was difficult again due to language uh, uh, deficits, but more or less we thought that it's more impaired on the right side. And uh, right left orientation was intact, fin finger gnosis was also in uh, intact, calculation was impaired. And on li line bisection, she uh, bisected the line slightly towards the right side, which may be secondary to the hemianobia. <clears throat> Occipital uh, log also similarly, right, there was right homonymous hemianopia on confrontation and uh, uh, color identification face and she couldn't describe due to the uh, language deficits. Uh, cranial, uh, uh, cranial log was normal except the right homonymous hemianopia, Georgia was also normal, there was, the gag reflex was intact. On uh, motor testing, the bulk was normal, no wasting, uh, tone was increased on, uh, sig significantly increased on right uh, as compared to the left, there was no cogwheeling, no velocity dependent effect. Dependence appreciable and power was around four by five across shoulder on the right side, but the uh, and the grip was uh, weak. 
and uh, on the left side was 5 by 5 all the dtrs were normal uh, and the planters were both flexor and there were no involuntary movements cortical sensation as we had discussed earlier uh, extra pyramidal testing there was bradykinesia and rigidity right significantly more than left posturing of right uh, more than left upper limb full test was negative no tremors cerebral testing was normal and she had difficulty in getting up from the chair, as we had seen in the video. She had walked with right uh, dragging gait, short stride, narrow base, multiple steps on turning, and with posturing of right more than left upper leg. And restoring, restoring posturing of uh, limbs uh, was prominent on walking, and there was no myoclonus. So, uh, to finally, as uh, uh, 58 year old uh, right handed lady presenting with acute onset rapidly progressive asymmetric right more than left neurological illness with involvement of dominant frontal lobe uh, uh, that is uh, no non fluent primary progressive aphasia phenotype left uh, parietal lobe apraxia and cortical sensory loss was there so dyspraxic uh, uh, right sided limbs were there and retrochiasmal visual affection as the patient had uh, right homonymous hemi uh, right hemianopia and uh, uh, basal ganglia and its connections uh, due to the bradykinesia, rigidity, and uh, dystonia. So, differential diagnosis. Okay, so, <clears throat> so, we can discuss the differentials that we thought. Yeah. Both the degenerative ones and the treatable ones. Initially, uh, we had thought of the uh, degenerative uh, causes only. Uh, so, the our first uh, differential was non fluent variant uh, uh, primary progressive aphasia, clinical phenotype of CBS. So, it is one of the four uh, pheno uh, clinical phenotypes. The so points in favor were asymmetry, apraxia, non fluent aphasia. However, it was too rapid to, uh, I mean, uh, to be called uh, CBS. Uh, another, another DD was FTD of GRN uh, subtype. And in this subtype, we can see apraxia as well as uh, the primary progressive aphasia and CBS. All three can be seen in this spectrum. But again, uh, rapidity is a point against uh, this diagnosis. And finally, uh, we had thought of uh, prion disease, Kruchfeld Yakub, uh, because points in favor was rapidity, cognition was involved, the language domain, visual symptoms, and extra parameter. But there was no, I mean, the presentation was very unusual for CJD. The absence of other cognitive and behavioral symptoms were not there. There was significant asymmetry and absence of myognos, and MRI was reported uh, normal. And mitochondrial, uh, at the first visit, the MRI was reported normal. And we had also thought of mitochondrial because it was multifocal and progressive. But again, there was no history of uh, hearing loss, seizures, or strong family history. Uh, we had thought of treatable causes like CN, uh, CNS infections like uh, simplex, neurosyphilis, HIV, uh, diffuse fungal infections uh, because of the diffuse involvement. However, there, were, there was absence of constitutional symptoms and the CSF uh, which was done earlier was reported normal and diffuse neoplastic uh, disease can also present with multifocal uh, uh, involvement and and but there were no signs of ice uh, IC, icp signs raised icp oh. or weight loss and the mri was reported normal earlier uh, another dd was primary cns vasculitis because of uh, rapid and multifocal involvement but however it, it would be progressive uh, i mean the this uh, our patient had progressive rather than step the pattern and another DD we had kept was neurosarcoid because of multifocal uh, involvement and progression. And there were no systemic sim uh, symptoms in patient and no significant cranial involvement. Should I proceed? proceed? <laughs> yeah, uh, just one second. A couple of uh, people in the audience have uh, offered a few more differentials, uh, specifically autoimmune. Yes, immune yeah. Mediated. So, uh, Oh, actually, I mentioned in the list. I <laughs> you, you missed the first one, I guess. <laughs> first one, yes. So, yes. Okay. So, so, autoimmune, yeah, definitely. IGLON yes. 5, uh, NMDAL, uh, and VGKC can present like uh, this. So, very rightly pointed out, IGLON is a good differential here because uh, the patient has hypersomnolence uh, in the mm -hmm. background and it is a extra pyramidal predominant uh, disorder in one and a half to two months of history. So yes, Iglon is a good differential, which we obviously tested. Any more uh, differentials? Yeah, I think yeah. you can continue. Oh, uh, okay. So now at uh, this stage, we had some background history. We had some previous investigations. 
but obviously with the with a strong suspicion with a strong structural suspicion that multi exit involvement of frontal parietal lobes were there and there was associated actually uh, idiomotor versus limb kinetic apraxia is i think difficult to uh, mm -hmm. say as of now because the asymmetry was there left side was less uh, apraxic so possibly limb kinetic apraxia and then it would be a subcortical involvement as well so we went again uh, with the mri and then there was a clinch so uh, it is uh, diffusion weighted axial images which shows uh, cort cortical ribboning in multiple uh, areas left uh, perisylvian area <clears throat> is significantly affected even the cingulate gyrus and in the parietal uh, posterior parietal area with uh, corresponding uh, adc drop is also present we can see in this image here so there was definite uh, uh, restricted diffusion and uh, here uh, in the in this uh, coronal section the, the, the uh, corresponding flare hyper intensity can also be appreciated however the basal ganglia hyper intensities were not very significant and uh, angio uh, was normal so uh, other investigations we had done hematology i mean uh, routine investigation cbc rft lft was normal csf we had done protein was 25 there were no cells uh, chloride was 129 glucose 59 and csf infective uh, markers was negative autoimmune profile uh, in csf as well as serum was negative we had also done perineoplastic workup and perineoplastic uh, autoimmune panel also which was negative and cct thorax and abdomen were negative and triple h was also negative this was the eeg uh, we had done uh, almost one to one month after uh, the presentation and it showed uh, the periodic uh, sharp wave complexes at uh, of around 200 to 400 uh, millisecond and occurring at uh, 0.5 to 1 second uh, interval which was quite uh, classical for cjd so uh, our patient mrs uh, eeg had rapidly progressive uh, uh, syndrome with right-sided posturing, field defect, and progressive non-fluent aphasia. And she had MRI picture as well as EEG suggestive of prion pathology. So our provisional diagnosis was CBS, PPA phenotype of uh, CJD. So, so, so go ahead, Ashtosh. We can we have a little more slides on CJD. So, uh, so based on the uh, uh, modes of occurrence, the prion diseases can be classified into sporadic, genetic, and acquired. Sporadic are most common, 85 to 90 percent, and there are various uh, subtypes based on the polymorphism. That, that is methionine and valine uh, subtype. So, MM1, MV1, PV1, MM2, MV2, and VV2. Genetic uh, are 10 to 15 percent. That is familial uh, CJD, uh, fatal familial insomnia, and GERD's menstrual skanker syndrome. And acquired uh, less than 1%, uh, which is, uh, I mean, less common, Kuru uh, variant CJD and uh, iatogenic uh, CJD. Sporadic, sporadic CJD is thought to occur through spontaneous misfolding of prime uh, protein into disease-causing form called uh, prime. And this process is believed to occur either spontaneously or possibly through a somatic mutation of PRNP gene, which results in PRPC, uh, which is the normal prime protein, misfolding into PRPSC. Uh, and genetic uh, prion uh, occur due to mutation of PRNP and acquired uh, PRDs are from unintentional transmission of prions to a person through medical procedures like uh, uh, dural graft transplant, the coronary transplant, and consumption of contamin contaminated beef or cannibalism, as in Kuru. But <laughs> so, uh, uh, these, these are the CDC diagnostic criteria for CJD uh, published in 2018. So for definite def uh, neuropathological confirmation is required. For probable neuropsychiatric disorder plus positive articuic test in CSF or other tissue. And uh, or in like in our case, we had a rapidly progressive dementia and two of the uh, that is we had visual symptoms and extra pyramidal from this myoclonus, visual or cerebral uh, signs, pyramidal extra pyramidal signs or echinatic mutism. And we also had positive EEG as well as uh, MRI. Uh, another test is 1433 uh, from CSF, which can be done, but uh, we couldn't do it. And we had ruled out all the alternative diagnoses. These are uh, MRI criteria for CJD uh, published by uh, University of California, San Francisco, 2017. And for definite CJD, that they advise that uh, DWI more than flare hyper intensity in cortex more than one gyrus and striatum. And uh, if if it's not there, then if 
for the cortex involved then more than 3 jar are required and uh, so uh, on on the basis of the polymorphisms also they have uh, mentioned that basal ganglia hyper intensities are more commonly seen in mv2 vv2 and mm1 uh, abnormal diffuse cortical ribbing is more common in vv1 mm2 mv1 and thalamic hyper intensity is uh, often more seen in vv2 and mv2 and these are some of the common gyri involved uh, the most common being the cingulate gyrus uh, other common are pre uh, precuneus uh, angular gyrus superior parietal middle uh, and frontal gyrus and least common is pre central gyrus so this is uh, one of the good article uh, published in bmg bmj uh, uh, titled cgd mimics and chameleons so like like in our case uh, 2% of case, cases uh, present with cortico basal syndrome dominated by extra pyramidal symptoms and signs and dyspraxia and asymmetry also like in our case 2% uh, 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 present with stroke like highly asymmetrical rapid onset motor presentation 2% uh, present with uh, sleep thalamic disorder sleep and uh, i mean peripheral pain and or sensory disturbance uh, 5% present with visual variant that is head and hand uh, variant uh, with cortical blindness hallucination very distressing and rapid clinical course 5% have psychiatric presentation uh, there is ataxic variant also which is uh, named brownell open hemor uh, which uh, presents with ataxia and there is one pure co uh, cognitive uh, presentation but more com most common is obviously classical cgd with global cognitive decline cerebral ataxia myoclonus and motor signs and these are some of the mimics i mean a mimics of uh, cjd uh, the rapidly progressive forms of neurodegenerative diseases delirium uh, viral encephalitis uh, hepatic failure encephalopathy cerebrovascular disease uh, metabolic and endocrine disorders primary cns vasculitis neurosarcoid primary cns lymphoma infections like pml fungal encephalitis lyme disease whipples neurosyphilis and uh, Uh, various other and these are some of the rare and untreatable causes uh, like sub acute ssp but the age of onset would be uh, quite young and mitochondrial cytopathy and diffuse neoplastic diseases like glomerulonephritis cell and these are some of the case reports uh, uh, where that uh, where that case is very similar to ours uh, a cortical basal syndrome variant of cjd with uh, stroke like onset another is uh, uh, cortico basal manifestation of cjd uh, another uh, case report had a uh, patient presenting with expressive aphasia and as well as serious epilepticus thank you so that was a very nice case uh, presentation and literature review and i think uh, we have dr rukmini and dr uh, Uh, Vikram from Nimhans uh, on the panel as well. So, uh, Rukmini Ma'am is in fact raising her hand, Ma'am. We would love to hear your comments. Ah, uh, it's a really nice case. Very interesting and nicely presented. Thank you. Yeah, uh, very nice case, Doctor Sutosh. Uh, I mean, very surprising. I mean, sort of. Uh, I had a similar case where I think I mean uh, when I was uh, not at Nimhans but in a different institute. Where the patient came to my OPD walking with CBS like presentation, very in, within couple of days I admitted by them he was wheelchair bound, and for final this one I had referred to Nimas within two days he became bed bound. That was the rapidity sort of with which the disease had progressed. Initially I had a suspicion of CBS, but then within a week I mean uh, so you can see the progression happening within your admission this one itself. That is the rapidity with which it sort of uh, progresses, and many a times it can. Make us think whether it is. Uh, I mean, uh, think of a lot of other alternative sort of uh, etiologies. Yes. And in this regard, although the the poster, one other thing that is sort of sometimes similar picture can happen is the hyperglycemic sort of uh, injuries. They also have this visual sort of phenomenon and hemianopia, all those things. But definitely, there will be very high sugar. And uh, one other, I mean, another spot. Very interesting case and uh, unfortunate for the patient. Yeah. So the other thing that I just wanted to mention was that the even though the uh, cortical hyper intensities ribbing is supposed to be, I mean, a, a criteria for a definite CJD, it can be seen in other disorders. Obviously, so it can be seen in uh, it has been described with other autoimmune encephalitis. Mm -hmm. The very interesting part about this patient was it's very unilateral. I mean, that is that is an uncommon feature, but that is more common in case of vascular or, you know, the I mean, CJD rather than the typical CBS. 
even though cbs is asymmetric you would expect that there are some uh, you know manifestations of both hemispheres so mm. this is very very typically it was very prominently left hemispheric abnormal nice uh, localization and i think it the rapidity by which it's progressing obviously makes it much more likely to be cjd if it was not for the progression vascular would be a very very strong possibility possibility one other i mean uh, sir you can go ahead and just add the point it sham sir Yes, Doctor. Yeah, um, I, I, this is again uh, for the benefit of the residents here. Uh, Ashutosh, uh, could you just go to that uh, your slide on differentials? Sure. First slide on differentials. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have written like a non-fluent variant of. Uh, and a uh, non fluent of his variant of uh, primary yes. progressive aphasia, clinical phenotype of CBS. Yes. Uh, if I can, I would li just like to make a correction here because uh, yes. I think there is you are confusing between CBS and CBD. So, CBS is a clinical syndrome, while CBD, cortico basal degeneration, yes. is the pathology. Yes. So, CBD can present with different clinical syndromes, out of which one is CBS. Right. So, actually, there is no non fluent. PPA variant of CBS. CBD. It is non fluent PPA variant of CBD. Okay. C CBD can have a CBS presentation, which is probably the commonest. Right. Apart from that, it can have a PSP presentation. That is, it can present like a Richardson syndrome. Hmm. It can present as a non fluent primary progressive aphasia. It can also present as a fondal behavioral spatial syndrome. Yes. So, out of which the CBS is the classical presentation. Okay. So, in this patient, I think we can call this a uh, CBS because she has all the she satisfies all the criteria of a corticobasal syndrome. She has an asymmetric Parkinsonism. She has a dystonia, which is again asymmetric, yes. and there is a clear cut cortical feature of apraxia. You have demonstrated apraxia in there, so she satisfies CBS. And yes. in CBS, this uh, aphasia as well as uh, the language dysfunction yes. is an accompaniment of uh, CBS. So yes. syndrome wise, this is a CBS, and she satisfies criteria for CBD. But what is odd for CBD in this patient? There are two oddities for CBD in this patient. One is the rapid progression, which you have mentioned. Yeah. And another thing is standing out. Can you mention what that is, Ashutosh? Sorry, sorry sir? Uh, so everything fits goes with yeah, CBD yeah, in yeah. this patient. One is the rapid progression. Yeah. Second one, can you mention what is the second one, which raises a question regarding a CBD diagnosis in this patient? Mm. So it visual is, symptom, visual yeah, symptoms. it is the hemianopia. It is yeah, a hemianopia. Yeah. It is an extremely unusual symptom in, yes, uh, right, in right. patient with a corticobasal syndrome, secondary to a corticobasal degeneration pathology. Yes, so yes. that visual symptoms as well as the rapid progression makes the CBD diagnosis very old. So you should search for other alternate causes of CBS. And considering the rapidity of progression, I think CJD with a initially normal MRI that rules out a structural pathology. Yes. So, uh, and later on, you found it, uh, characteristic features of uh, CJD in this patient. So, I think that takes you to, the, to a diagnosis of CJD. Yes. Okay. Uh, Vikram, you wanted to make Thank a you. comment? Uh, yeah. So, uh, just an addition to Rukmini ma'am's uh, comment that uh, there are many differentials for that cortical ribboning and the DW restriction with the basal ganglia hyperintensity. One thing, although I cannot quote the exact literature, but one thing, one useful point I noted was in CJD, it is always, if in all the other causes, there is a possibility of edema. I mean, it will be more of sort of even postic pill. So it is sort of a bit bulky, the gyri. Whereas yeah. in CJD, the bulkiness of the gyri will not be there. I mean, that is one interesting point or I mean, a useful point. So if there is any bulkiness of the basal ganglia or the gyri, then we should always look for an alternative, how much ever the case may look like CJD. So there is always a possibility that it is going to be something else. Uh, it may be even a seronegative autoimmune nephritis as well. I mean, uh, we may not get on antibody and just because we didn't get, it shouldn't be like it is not autoimmune nephritis. So we should always give a good trial of immunotherapy, even if we feel it is CJD, especially if the sort of radiological picture is showing that gyral sort of thickening and also the basal ganglia sort of edema.
Dr. Vaishak, any audience questions? I think that we have uh, someone There's has asked. One regarding yeah. 14th day, I think that's the uh, yes. In fact, they say nowadays that the MRI pictures are more than 92% sensitive, obviously not specific as uh, Vikram sir just said. But if you talk about sensitivity, then it's MRI first and then uh, comes the CSF 14143. quick is coming up as a uh, very promising uh, diagnostic test, but I think the availability is a major issue where we take the buccal mucosa and the olfactory mucosa uh, for testing of the brain proteins. Is is RTQ available in India now, Dr. Vikram? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I mean, uh, not at NIMHAS. We do 14v3, but uh, as he rightly pointed out, 14v3 basically is a proxy for anything that is happening quite quickly with significant neural damage. So it can be positive in autoimmune encephalitis also. And uh, I would be surprised if it is negative here, but even if it comes positive, it is not going to improve my diagnostic certainty any further. Based on already quite significant uh, features that are there, clinical, radiological, and the rapidity, everything is pointing towards CBS. It is not going to increase that certainty any further, with, even with a positive 1433. So I don't think if the 1433 test is not available, there is no point in sort of pursuing it. But yes, definitely article is quite specific. So although it is not currently available in India, and uh, again, that's what. So most of the time, what happens clinically, we already sort of the differential that we have, like most of the time, it will be either with autoimmune encephalitis, where again, it can be positive. So with the usual clinical sort of uh, practical situations, the so 14 c is not going to change much. I mean, although it is there in the diagnostic criteria, but most of the practical scenarios, already most of the time, it is autoimmune encephalitis is one of the DD, and it is not going to differentiate between either of these two. Because it is just sort of a proxy for uh, severe neuronal, rapid neuronal damage that is happening in CBS. I just have a quick question to the entire panel. I uh, mean, when we do see patients of this nature, do you uh, pra pragmatically give them a trial of immunosuppression or immunomodulation? All of them? Or what is your actual practice like? Shamsa? Uh, what uh, we do is, uh, we do a CSO. If CSF protein is high, it means there is some sort of an immuno, uh, inflammation going on. So when there is a very rapidly progressive syndrome like this, even if uh, all uh, obviously all the other workup will be done, all the other autoimmune workup will be done. If everything is negative, but CSF protein is high and uh, patient has a very rapidly progressive syndrome, we definitely give a trial of steroids. Mm. But going beyond that, if there is an improvement, significant convincing objective improvement with steroids, we may go for further immunotherapy, but uh, very rarely only we face with such a situation. That is what... So would you do. give like pulse steroids and weight or give them a little bit yeah, of more oral steroids? Five day, and five day course of oral oh, or middle penicillin, uh, I mean, uh, IV middle penicillin, followed by an oral taper and see whether there is any clinical mm -hmm. improvement. If it is there, convincing improvement is there, we discuss other empirical immunotherapies with the patient. If there is, if it is a rapidly progressive syndrome with elevated CSO protein. Charu ma'am, I think wants to... Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, I agree with Sham that right homonymous hemianopia is absolutely unusual for the CB, CBS phenomenology as well as CBD pathology. <clears throat> uh, and second thing is how acute was the onset of this? You know, you have not clearly mentioned. If it is a kind of over days, then you would think of the non-vascular etiologies. And if you carefully examine this patient, you will always find subtle signs on the opposite side. So were there any subtle signs of apraxia on the left side in this patient? Yes, ma'am. So, uh, hello. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So yes, uh, there were there were dystonic signs on the left side, and a stereoagnosis. I guess the speech deficits were a problem, but still, uh, it was difficult for the patient to even understand. Uh, in the A-stereognosis testing on the left also. If Ashutosh can play left the gate once again, the, the patient has some dystonic portioning of the left as well while the patient uh, walks as correctly pointed out by ma'am. Yeah, so it's always a dictum to examine the side which looks apparently normal because you know the abnormal side has a lot of signs and symptoms. But make it a point to look at the, the side which looks normal and you will invariably find 
the differences, particularly in the CB CBS phenotypes that you see. And how acute was the onset? Was it in days? Was it in minutes? Was it in... So, so the history that the patient gave, ma'am, was, was very acute. So the first time she observed the fumbling of words was while in a social gathering. And people who were around her told her what happened to your voice. So, so that acute was the onset of the speech issues. But later on, she said that every three days or six days, there were some new additions to the symptomatology. Again, acute every time. So, so this, so over the this days, was a pretty... Over the days, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Okay. So just want to make one comment for steroids. I mean, to my uh, opinion, steroids really don't have any role in CJD. I don't think that people have tried immunomodulation, but it has not worked. We have given steroids in patients whom we had a doubt where it was not very clear. But that has not actually led to any improvement in, in our patients of CJD. So what has happened is that they've worsened more. So sometimes your EEG may not show, pick up the abnormality initially. And or the imaging, just like in this patient, probably the imaging did not pick it up earlier. So when you have, when you come with an instance where you don't have a clear-cut imaging abnormal uh, idea or a EEG, Idea, and you're thinking in terms of whether there is an autoimmune component or an inflammatory component, then yeah, you. I mean, we've given serious. I'm not saying that we have been, but we have. But even in my uh, experience, it has not really helped at all. Sam, sir. Yeah, I, I mentioned steroids not as a treatment of uh, uh, CJD. Yeah. You are suspecting an, another autoimmune. Auto yeah. Correct. We also give it uh, uh, if we are suspecting the autoimmune uh, disorder. Like if it's too acute an onset and if the CSF is grossly abnormal, then of course we send Iglon and uh, LGI1, which are the closest, closest uh, diagnostic differential diagnosis. That's why we give in some patients steroids. I don't know whether it will worsen the prion pathology. I don't know the answer to that. Ma'am, this patient also received uh, three days of steroids before coming to us. At day 20 of the illness, they said that they underwent an MRI and a LP at the previous place where they were consulted. And they did give steroid for three to four days, Ashutosh, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. And 14.3.3 is an acute phase reactant. It, it mm. will help you if you are clinically correlating with it. But otherwise, it is not going to help you if you are questioning your diagnosis. Vikram, you want to say something? No, yeah, that's what same here in uh, this one also. I mean, uh, immunomodulator only when we have sort of a bit doubt, still we are sort of trying to clarify it. Meanwhile, I mean, it sort of buys us time also sort of to talk to the patient regarding the diagnosis. So in the sense that uh, just start on the immunomodulator if it is quite acute and we don't have enough evidence to convincingly say it is CJD. Just sort of, I mean, if at all we have any doubt in our mind that uh, is it still possible that it is a sort of a manifestation of autoimmune encephalitis. And uh, like Shamsar told, if there is any other evidence in form of CSF or atypical presentation, then uh, trial of steroid. Uh, in very few cases, we have also given LVPB thinking it may be a manifestation of seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. And uh, that's what. But sometimes it is difficult to say, I mean, put a stop. I mean, like uh, the patient relatives are also very keen to do whatever they can. And then, like IVAG, LVPP may be a bit costly. Luckily, we in the central and in the government institute, it's quite cheap. So it will not be a financial burden to the patient. But in any setup, to give a diagnosis like CJD is very difficult. And you have to be very confident that, yeah, it is because there is sort of a death sentence and the patient may not go anywhere else after that. So we are going to miss a chance, if at all, we were wrong. So that is why. Usually, just sort of it buys us time also. Like, I mean, five days, still not. Meanwhile, we sort of ensure, I mean, confirm that it is actually CJD and also break the news to the relatives also slowly that, yeah, I mean, there is nothing else that we can do as of now apart from uh, symptomatic uh, supportive therapy. Also, sir, regarding the outcome of the patient, uh, when we asked for this, EEG was not available for to us when we prescribed it. Uh, the patient was lost to follow up for a month or so. And then we asked for it again. Uh, the relatives told that the patient succumbed in uh, September. So it was a course of five months, I guess, uh, since the onset mm -hmm. of the illness. And again, special thanks to Petras Vadia, sir. I was uh, in Mumbai when this case was reported. And uh, now I'm at Jaipur back. So we did ask for the follow-up and unfortunately patient had succumbed. 
Okay, uh, I think we've had uh, two very wonderful cases today, an excellent discussion from the audience and uh, the panelists. And uh, I would like to hand over to Ajay for the vote of thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, Divyani. At the outset, thank all the office bearers of the IAN for helping us bringing out this uh, program uh, very regularly. And also the digital team, which uh, diligently organizes uh, the webinar to work in a very seamless manner. So we had a very uh, great session Two excellent presentations on a spectrum of uh, movement disorders, a very fruitful discussion, which will help us all in our clinical practice. Uh, I thank Dr. Sham. Great to see you, sir, uh, for agreeing to be our senior moderator, being with us and giving us your valuable time. Uh, thank you for the valuable points that you made that we will be all learned from. It's a privilege to have you. Uh, Vaishak, thanks again. Uh, he, he was key to putting this all together in a very efficient manner. It is great to have you on board, and we appreciate uh, your efforts towards the YNF. Uh, uh, Dr. Neha and Dr. Uh, Jackie, thank you for the first case. Very fine learning uh, points from your uh, rare case. And uh, uh, we thank you for sharing, sharing this rare case with us all. We all uh, now know to ask this history uh, for any uh, toxicity, especially glue sniffing. Uh, Dr. Ashutosh and uh, Dr. Vaibha, uh, very good and detailed methodic case presentation. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, highly appreciate it. Also, thank Dr. Vikram and Dr. Victor, uh, uh, Rukmini and Dr. Charu for joining us and giving us your valuable view views. Uh, Divyani, always you deserve a lot of praise for your leadership and uh, enterprise in making these sessions a huge success. Uh, so that brings us to the end of this session. And now that we have had our uh, dose of academics, it is, I think, time to enjoy the rest of the day uh, in a guilt-free way. I move over to the finals of the World Cup. Uh, cheer for India. I thank you all for joining. Uh, probably the next time we meet, uh, hopefully we will be the Cricket World Champions. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Bye.